I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Scriptural Way Bible Study. The Scriptural Way Bible Study is brought to you by the Seminole Point Church of Christ, located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. Now, let's take our Bibles and seek the Scriptural Way. Greetings, I'm John Duvall. I'm Micah Duvall. And I'm Dale Decker. And this is a Scriptural Way broadcast. Well, Dale, we have a younger person joining us this evening. We do. We might as well break these young people in, and especially since our topic is time for school, it's a good time for him to learn firsthand right here in front of the rest of us. Exactly. I, I figured when we talk about this, it'd be good for him to relay the number of times he's been expelled. Uh, or the number of times he's been harassed or picked on. Or picked on others. Or he picked on others. That's exactly right. Of course, it's not the lesson to talk about your younger brother either, right? And so, also, it would be a good time to talk about how the father has done and what kind of job he's done as far as training this young <laughs> buck. Micah, let me introduce you to everybody. Everybody, this is Micah, my oldest son. And um, I asked him if he'd like to set in with us since we're kind of talking about matters pertaining to school and preparation for school. And so he agreed to set in with us this evening. And uh, John is busy with some personal matters. And we were going to have Luke to sit in, but um, Luke's little baby, um, we think, got bit by a brown, brown recluse spider and possibly here at the building. So we need to look after that. And so he's at home helping his wife tend to her tend to uh, um, his baby's sores and everything. So definitely keep them in our minds and in our prayers. So it's good to have everyone with us in the chat room. Well, I see several people have joined us this evening and um, it's always good to have you with us. If this is the first time for you, we'd love to hear your comments and questions that you might have. You can click on the guest button down beneath uh, the chat or in the chat room window there and type in your name and then you'll be able to enter comments uh, during the course of our study. But please be sure to do that. We'd like to hear from you and get your participation as well. Dale, uh, do we have anything coming up here in the next couple weeks or month that we need to let everybody know about? We do. We have a gospel meeting coming up uh, uh, October the 4th through the 6th which is a fat Friday through Sunday. Okay. All right, and that's right. we have a young man from Arkansas, by, or actually, uh, forget Alabama, Alabama now, I guess. Yeah, Alabama. Aaron Andrews. Uh, been preaching down there for a congregation of about 150 members, and we've invited him to come up, and uh, he's going to have some excellent lessons. We'll be sending out some information on that very shortly. And getting our website up to date with that. I've been a little bit behind on getting the information on our website. So we'll see if we can't do that tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that meeting. Aaron will do a good job. And um, his wife is expecting another child. Yeah, but uh, we don't want to get that word out. So please don't say anything because I don't think they've told their parents yet. Oh. <laughs> All righty. Well, yep. <laughs> I tell you what, let's go ahead and jump right into our lesson before I do anything else like that. Last week we began a, we began a study called Time for School. Time for School. And with that, the first part of this lesson, we were looking at how as parents we need to be preparing our young people. If, if your kids go to a public school um, or they go to some school away from you, there are preparations, things that we need to do to get them ready. Now, even if you homeschool your children, you still need to work to get them ready in order to enter into the world and to, to be able to uh, communicate with other people and to face other people and deal with other people. And so with that being the case, what we looked at last week, Dell, was we talked about we need to prepare our children to be seen. The fact that other people are going to be watching them. God, of course, is going to be watching them. We showed that we need to prepare young people to make the right choices. And Micah, that's very, very important in the life of a young person. Um, and one of the things we really didn't put in here is, and we'll talk about it here in just a moment, is to learn from mistakes, okay? 
And we talked about teaching our young people to be prepared to take a stand, be willing to stand up for what is right, for what they know to be right. So, Dale, any thoughts or comments about that before we continue? No, I think we should get right into it. Okay. Well, Micah, one of my responsibilities as a father and your mom's responsibility as a mother is to prepare you to be wrong. That's why you always hear me say, you're wrong, son. Yes. (laughs) 75% of the time. 75. Well, you need to be right more often. There you go. (laughs) Well, the fact of the matter is, is that there are going to be times within the young people's lives when they mess up, when they have the information wrong, when they fail a test, they do something wrong, and they've got to know how to handle it. I mean, I've seen a lot of adults, Dale, and I'm sure you have too, who don't know how to be wrong. Well, you know, there's that old saying that when you're wrong, you should be wrong at the top of your voice! Yes. <laughs> now, if only Eli had talked with his sons like that, he might have made an impact. Actually, I think Eli should have done a better job teaching his children to begin with. And in a loud voice. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, the only reason I use that analogy that I used is that generally when people are wrong, they have a tendency to raise their voice because they want, yep. to, they want to emphasize that, no, I can't be wrong. I refuse to be wrong. And, and, and so we'll raise our voice. And in fact, we know we're wrong. And that's why we yeah. raise our voice. It reminds me, I heard one time, how you deal with a bear, especially up in Alaska. If, if, if you are out in the wild and you, you see a bear, you know what you do? Well, I know what I'd do. I'd always be with a companion and I'd just make sure I could outrun that companion. I heard this from someone that lives up in Alaska. You raise your arms up and be as tall as you can and you yell to the top of your lungs, okay? because it gives that bear the appearance that there's another bear there. Now, my whole point is, you're just faking the bear out. And that's what people try to do when they're wrong and they raise their voice, going back to what you were talking about there, Dale. So let's take a minute and let's read the story of Eli, because here's a case in point of a judge, one of the judges of Israel, who failed to discipline his son. And um, Michael, I'll have you to read that if you would, starting in 1 Samuel 2, beginning there, in verse 12, and let's read down initially through verse 17. All right. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also before they burned the fat, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And if man said to him, They should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer him, No, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. All right, so the first thing that we know saw there in verse 12, he says, the sons of Eli were corrupt. And through their actions, they caused people to abhor the offerings of the Lord. All right, now let's look down there to chapter 3, verse 13. And look and, and read that and see what Eli did or did not do in relationship to his son. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. All right, Dale, we notice there in that phrase, this is a he did not restrain them. Eli did not restrain his sons. Now, he doesn't tell us, you know, for how long, five years, 10 years, 15 years. The fact of the matter is he did not restrain his sons. And do you think that was the reason why his sons turned out the way they did, or at least contributing factor to it? Well, absolutely. I mean, you go back to verse 12 in chapter 2, and it says they know not, King James says they know not the Lord. Yeah. Uh, so we don't know how much teaching uh, Eli did to his sons to begin with. Uh, he was a priest, uh, or, or a judge rather, and, and uh, you would think that he took time to teach his children. The other problem though is sometimes adults get so busy in their occupation, and I, I don't want to pick on preachers, but I've seen this happen with preachers. They get so involved in trying to help everybody else in the congregation 
that they forget about their own family. Yeah. Uh, and adults do this as well. We get so involved in our jobs that when we come home, we don't want to spend time with our children. We let the television babysit them. We let uh, video games, whatever, babysit them. Sometimes we don't even know where they are. They're, they may be outside playing with friends, and we don't have a clue where they are. Right. And this may be Eli's problem, is he did not spend enough time with his sons to properly raise them to begin with, and here we have them now in a situation where they uh, are corrupt, and he made no efforts to stop it. I would almost theorize that his sons let the power go to their head, that all they were concerned with was, uh, we are priests. And this is our role, and this is what you have to do for us. Not out of service unto God, but out of some outward actions based on their, their um, well, they let it go to their head. <laughs> well, the problem that's is, all they were concerned is, with. is there's uh, priests by way of inheritance, yeah. and there's priests by way of being taught properly how to be a priest. Yeah. And I think Eli failed in that, resp in exactly. that uh, respect. Yeah. Sadly enough, now we're not going to talk about uh, Samuel, but Samuel's sons turned out corrupt as well, which is very tragic. But we've got a comment in the chat room that I want to go ahead and bring in um, a question by Brian uh, up earlier in their chat in the discussion there, uh, Travis. He says, um, is it okay to let the child fail or should we try and help them make the right choice? Okay. Um, Adrian says, better fail now than to fail as an adult. And Barrick says, Brian, I think they should make their own mistakes. It teaches consequences. Um, and the way, I kind of agree with that. I mean, there are going to be certain times where if your child wants to try something, and it's not life-threatening, we understand that, um, and you try to tell them, look, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, and they're going to go ahead and do it anyway, let them do it. You know, because that's how, you know, they, they, they learn to fail, you know. I mean, I don't know how Michael would turn out today if every time he went to do something that was incorrect, we put our we, we stopped him. You know, I mean, you've you've done a few things, haven't you? Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> there was one time he and his sister, when they were younger, were riding some sort of motorized vehicle, and yes. she was older, so it's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> of course, not but, the one driving. Yeah, but you did something stupid and I lost did. a tooth, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I never found that tooth. Never found it, yeah. But the point is, though, is that there are going to be times you have to let the kids make a mistake. Now, obviously, again, if you see your kid about to stick, their, stick something in a light socket, granted, if they succeed, they'll learn a great lesson, but you're going to run to them and stop them from doing that. I mean, there's just no, no question about that. And um, so, yes, they need to learn to make mistakes there. Rhonda says, coming on down there, that consequences are so important. If your child fails not to... If your child does not lean, learn, I'm sorry, if your child does not learn that actions bring consequences, then the parents have failed in the proper parenting. You know, and that's the point. Every child has to learn that there are consequences um, to their actions. There are definite consequences to their actions. All right. Any thoughts or comments, Micah? Um, it's kind of like, you can tell when children haven't had consequences done to them because those are the kids in school that are like, you know, they think they're all that and they're children who maybe talk back to their parents or if they get punished by a teacher, it's like, it's no big deal because you're not, bo you're not the boss of me, I'm the boss of you. And that's how they are now. There, it's it's kind of like that, that I, you know, we, we, we believe in freedom in America and kids think that this applies to them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Dale, any thoughts? No. Okay. All right, uh, let's see. Barrick says in the chat room, he says, um, it's an old adage, a cobbler's children have no shoes. And kind of going back to what you were talking about a while ago, Dale. You know, as far as fathers not tending to their families. They're so right. busy in, in their own occupations. Right. Yeah. And um, I think it's a very, very good point there. Let's see. And then we'll do one more and then two more, and then we'll step back into the outline. Coming down to Rhonda's comments, she says, children need to learn to succeed with grace and fail with dignity. Having enough humility to realize their successes are, bless are blessings and dignified enough to, be re to uh, realize the need to pick themselves up 
from mistakes and learn from them and do better the next time. And that's true. Children need to learn. Children need to learn how to fail. They need to learn how to react after they fail. And Adrian says, um, oh, "It's a personal comment there to." Um, I knew. Anyway, <laughs> well, we talked about the story about Eli here, but Dell, even the Book of Proverbs, Solomon, given the wisdom uh, by God, makes some really good comments in regard the need to correct the children. And what we find, parents, is that as we teach our children the benefit of correction and to accept correction when they are wrong, then we are helping them when they are at school with teachers, when they grow up to get a job, when they, when they go to college and they get a job and then get married, they learn how to receive correction in a proper spirit. Now let's read the two passages from Proverbs. The first one beginning in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13, please. Actually, I'd like to go to Proverbs 13, verse 24 and read several passages from Proverbs because it all fits right along with 23, 13. deviate from the outline, don't exactly you? Exactly right. All right, you go right ahead. <laughs> if you look at Proverbs 13, verse 24, the proverb writer says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Uh, now, obviously God is not telling us to beat our children. Uh, and there are some who have problems with spanking their children. But the point that God is making here is that children must be corrected, and they must be corrected properly. Uh, some may not have problems with spanking. I think that uh, the Board of Education on the Seat of Understanding sometimes is a good thing. But it should be done properly, and it should be done with love. We go to the proverb writer again in Proverbs 19 and verse 18, and we see what he has to say over here. Uh, and in verse 18 he says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy son spare for his crying, or set not thy heart on his destruction. So the point is, the time to really correct a child is, is from the very beginning. Uh, I've seen many toddlers uh, get by with a lot of things that they never should get by with because of the fact that the parents think that it's cute. But the time to correct the child is, is from the t very beginning of the time that they're able to understand. Uh, and so there's nothing wrong with, with correcting them early. We go over to Proverbs 22 and we look at verse 15. And he says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Again, children are going to make mistakes. That's obvious. But a good parent will always take time to correct the child and ask them if they had an opportunity to do it again, is there any thing they would do differently uh, the next time. And that's how they learn. We go over to Proverbs 23 and verse 13. And here we read, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Uh, a good uh, spanking or, or a good solid correction, whether it be time out or standing in the corner, however you dish from your child, the important thing is that they understand that they made a mistake and that they do uh, that uh, if they could do it again, they wouldn't make that same mistake. We go to Proverbs 29 and verse 15. And we look at Proverbs 29 and verse 15, and the proverb writer here says, uh, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And then finally, Proverbs 10 and verse 1, going back there, uh, because this goes along with it as well. Uh, Proverbs 10 and verse 1 says, The proverb of Solomon, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Yeah. So the important thing, and, and, and obviously God has spent a lot of time pointing out the fact that if we properly correct our children and we help them understand that they made a mistake here and that they need to do things differently in the future, that child will grow up to be a, uh, make a glad father and uh, a very happy mother as well. That's right, that's right. We need to go ahead and take our first break, we, but when we come back, there are two, two key points I wanna come back to in the passages that you read a while ago, Dale, that really lays the foundation for understanding why it is so important that we 
properly teach our children. So we'll look at that on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Hello, I'm Ron Witt, one of the elders of the Seminole Point Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to invite you to be our guest at any of our worship services and Bible classes. The meeting place of the Seminole Point Church of Christ is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, zip code 73013. The Seminole Point Church of Christ meets Sunday mornings at 930 for Bible classes, 1030 for worship service, and 5 p.m. for our afternoon worship service. We also have Bible classes on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Whether you live in Oklahoma City area or you are traveling through Oklahoma City, we would love to have you come and be our guest. We have Bible classes for all ages. At the Seminole Point Church of Christ, our focus is to teach only the Word of God. Rest assured that when you visit with us, you will find that we will appeal only to God's precious word. Now, let us return to our study. Welcome back to our study. Two things, Dale, that I wanted to point out from the passages that you read. The first one was from Proverbs 22, verse 15. The first thing he says there is foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Now, Micah, this is not intended as an insult to children. <laughs> But it's just that the fact of the matter is that when a baby is born, the brain um, has no learning. I mean, and it has to learn from the very early age. I mean, it learns how to eat. It learns how to cry to get the mother's attention. It learns so many different things there. And it takes a long time because the brain continues to grow. I heard a, a, someone, and in, in Adrian, who's a, a chemistry teacher, may relate to this as far as, and she may have heard this before, but I've heard it said that if you were to take children, teenagers specifically, and you would, you would compare them in the, the chemi chemical balance within the brain, that based on the way they behave, you could pretty much declare them brain damaged. Okay. And it's not that the brain is damaged, but the brain is undeveloped, it's still growing. The hormone process is still developing. Um, and it's still maturing. And so in that sense, foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. You know, child's got to be taught, it's got to be structured. Uh, physics teacher, sorry about that. Um, has, got to be, has got to be taught in such a matter to shape this brain. And so we then go over to the other verse that Dale read a while ago, chapter 23 there in verse 13. He says, do not withhold correction from a child. You know, a, a child has got to learn, but when a child does something that is wrong, they've got to be corrected. They've got to be pointed in the right direction. They've got to be shown the consequences. I remember one, you know, my, my mom and dad both disciplined me, but my mom, my mom, can't talk right, my mom was the one that welded the paddle uh, more frequently, and the belt, and the hand, and the twig, and anything else she could find on the backside whenever it was needed. And I learned, although pretty stubborn in this process, I learned that if you do this, then you, here's the result, and the result hurts. Well, that's the whole point of consequences. You teach your children that you don't want consequences, therefore you don't want the things that would bring about to the undesired consequences. And so hence the need to correct the children so much so. A couple comments in the chat room. Um, specifically, Travis, let's look at uh, Brian's point. Um, he says, I believe. I believe a proper reverence for God starts by instilling respect for parents. The parents need to have earned the respect, but they will learn to respect authority starting in the home. Um, and that's true. And, and I think children, Dell, I think children, young children, naturally respect their parents just because they're the ones that raise them and feed them. But it doesn't take much for a parent to sour that respect, if you would, and it doesn't take much for the parent to increase that level of respect. Well, to build on what Brian said and to build on what you said there is when it comes to raising children, this has to be 100% agreement between the mother and the father. Yeah. The same with the discipline as well. Uh, you cannot have the two arguing or discussing or disagreeing 
with how a child is being raised because that's when a child uh, develops a lack of respect for their parents. Yeah. When they see that their parents can't agree on things, uh, then why should the child even make an effort to obey them? Why should the child make an effort to grow up in a responsible way? Right. So parents should certainly sit down and discuss uh, how they're going to, before they ever have a child, they should sit down and discuss how they're going to raise that child. What kind of uh, discipline will they incorporate in their mm -hmm. family and everything? This should be a total agreement between the husband and the wife, the mother and father. And this should all be done before they make that decision to bring a child into the world so that as a household, they're all one when it comes to raising that child because it's a great responsibility. Yeah. Adrian puts a comment there in the chat room and we'll come back and catch Rose Lidos here in a few minutes, but she says, think about how difficult that must be for a family stricken with divorce. Well, and I agree and, with Adrian. Yeah. I mean, when you look at uh, many of the young uh, adults that are troubled, that get into trouble, mm -hmm. they're from broken homes. Yeah, and, and, and the reason being is because the mother and the father who are divorced and everything can't get along with each other and they certainly don't agree with how the child is being raised. Yeah, and many many times affections will be tried to be one purchased. You know, well, we'll go come over to my house and I'll let you have cake and ice cream for breakfast. Well, yeah, exactly whereas the other right. one won't. But here's the other problem too. I mean, when depending on the state that they're in and everything, one is going to have custody, the other is going to have visitation rights. Yeah, but some states will say, okay, when the child reaches a certain age, then the child can make the decision who they want to live with. And what happens is the two divorced parents end up trying to do everything they can to get that child to make the decision to live with them. And there's a reason for that is because in divorces and everything, someone is paying child support. Well, if it's the one that has the visitation rights that's paying the child support, which usually it is, they want that child to live with them, so they no longer have to pay child support. Money so what do they do? Issue. They, they yeah. give them everything under the sun and, and they won't discipline them and everything because they want that child to like them. And that's basically what it boils down to. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm that's, off my soapbox That's now. true. <laughs> but that's true though. And it kind of comes back to something I wanted to go ahead and jump to here. You know, asking Micah this, you have, when, when you have kids that are raised in this capacity or after this manner, where there's not a united front on uh, consequences and discipline at home, or where their kids are raised to think that you know that they're the smartest kid in town and they can do no wrong, you end up going to school then with kids who, when they get in trouble, they're shocked, aren't they? Yes, a lot actually. <laughs> a lot of kids that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it makes it hard on the teacher, doesn't it? Yes, because they're not used to, you know, getting in trouble. And when they do, you'll have some that will break down and cry. And I mean, I've done this before. You broke down and cried? Back in elementary, oh, okay. yes. <laughs> Every time I'd get in trouble, I'd always, you know, I'd start panicking, thinking that, oh, what are my parents going to do to me? Yeah. And then I'd always break down and cry, but not in front of everyone else. So. The problem is you've got, a, you've got a bunch of young people that will say, well, you just wait till my mommy and daddy gets up here. Yes. They'll straighten it out. They'll bail me out. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell the teacher how, how the cow eats the cabbage. <laughs> you, you brought up another thing that I was going to bring up while ago. Is the worst thing that a mother can do, it, it, I mean, today we have uh, two income families. Sure. That makes it very difficult. But if possible, the, the mother generally tries to stay home while the children are young and everything. The worst thing the mother can do when a child gets in trouble is say, you wait till your daddy gets home. True. Now, my wife would deny it, but she tried that one time with me. And when I got home and she did that, I said, what did my motherless child do this time? <laughs> and from that point on, we disciplined the child when the child was in error at that time and not wait until one of the parents come home. Well, that, that brings up a very good point, though. I mean, if, if you make a child sit and wait five hours before they're, they're, they're punished, they tend to forget the immediacy of the problem, you know. Whereas if it's done right away, it's fresh on the, the mind there. Um, in the chat room, let's go back up to Barrick's, uh, actually go back to Rosalito's comment. 
Travis, where he says that uh, part of the children is to obey or respect the parents and the Lord for this is right. Paul says that in Ephesians 6, Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 4. And said the parents, uh, the part of parents is to bring them up in discipline and instruction. Now Barrett goes on to say, and this is regards to uh, the discussion about a divided family there. He says, yes, 100% united front. One parent must not undermine the other parent, especially the father undermining the mother. This causes a problem for the mother when disciplining the child, especially when viewed through the, the light of divorce, as was mentioned there. Randy Cavender says couples need to understand that when they bring children into the world, they're not bringing playthings into the world, but a living soul that will be in eternity somewhere. And parents are responsible to leading, teaching, and training that child so they will go to heaven someday. And that's a good point. You're not bringing in to the world a friend, a buddy, a play toy, or even a confidant. You're bringing into the world a child that you're responsible to raise up, prepare them. You know, and, and that's, it should be the goal of every parent to raise their child to the point to where they will willingly serve God. Raise their child so they can move out of the house and live on their own and make wise decisions there. Uh, Barrick says, here in the UK, the kids have kids. The kids have kids to get out of home or to get support for that kid that is benefits. Um, this is, I believe, has recently uh, been taken away and you'll have kids here in the States do the same thing, tragically. And um, one more thought on the discipline. Barrick says it must not be done in anger. You know, and that, that's a good point. You know, you should never, and I'll give you a chance to speak with anonymity. <laughs> anonymity. Uh, amnesty, amnesty, yeah. I'll give you a moment to speak. But anyway, in principle, the parent should never punish their child out of anger. And that's hard to do. It's really hard to do, especially when, when they spill a drink in, in their dad's office or something other like that. You know, uh, you, 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 you get upset at that moment, but you should never discipline out of anger. Would you say? Yes, exactly. I mean, if you're going to discipline someone, at least have a reason to do it, not just anger. Okay. Well, and, and especially, Dale, you, know, you think about this, if you want to spank your child, when you're angry with your child, that's really not the time to exercise corporal force against the backside. It would be better to let your anger calm down so that anything that is rendered is rendered justly and fairly. Wouldn't you think that'd be the case? Oh, I'd agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and see, you, there, there's been some YouTube videos and so forth, things you know like that, where they'll catch their parents with hidden cameras. The point is, Discipline out of anger does nothing but to alienate the, the child's respect from the parents because all they see is anger out of control and they don't see the proper purpose of the discipline. You know, and so it's something definitely good, good points there to, to consider. Uh, we've got a couple more comments, but we'll jump to those here in just a minute. There's something I wanted to bring into real quick there. Um, over in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, we uh, referenced this a while ago. Uh, in Rosalito's comment where the father is told to train up the child in the, um, <laughs> to bring up the child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, here's the thing. Bringing up the child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord involves correction. I say that because according to Hebrews chapter 12, the Lord himself disciplines his children. Let's turn over there for a moment. Hebrews chapter 12 and let's read verses five through 11. 5 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning there in verse 5. And you have forgotten, or, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chasten us, and as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. 
Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, you know, when you look at God and the way God has dealt with His people, He disciplines them. And fathers, if we bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it will involve discipline as well. Any thoughts or comments, Micah or Dale? Yeah, along with this and everything, uh, a verse that we read last week and everything uh, is found in De Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, in verse 9. And it says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul dilig diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. This is the important point that the Deuteronomy is making. Teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So the point is that uh, you know, my mother, if she was still living today, she would be uh, 78, I guess. Uh, maybe right at 80. At any rate, if I came home to visit her and she told me to take out the trash, I'd take out the trash because that's my mother and I'm going to obey her. Right. And I don't care how old my children are, I still expect them to respect me and to do as I say uh, because I'm the father and I raised sure. them. Uh, the proverb writer in Proverbs 22nd chapter verse 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. And I would agree with that. If we properly discipline our children, if, if the, both parents work together uh, and are in harmony as they're raising that child and they spend a lot of time just as uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother did with mm -hmm. him, training him from a child uh, you know, how much Bible uh, do you get when you're at home? Uh, do you constantly read the Bible together as a family? Uh, do you dis agree on the disciplining, on the training of the child? The odds are that child will not depart from the way if all of this is done. And that doesn't mean that the child won't depart. Right. But there's a much better chance of that child being faithful to God if the training and correction is proper in accordance with the way God intended for it to be. If we go over and we read what Paul said to the church at Colossia in Colossians the third chapter and verse 20, uh, 21, Colossians 3 and verse 21. Paul said here, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. Now I wanted to read that just because of the fact that what you said a while ago uh, when we discipline a child, we don't want to do it in anger. Right. Because if we do it in anger, then the child is, chances are going to be discouraged. They're going to rebel against you. And they're going to turn and, and do things uh, in spite of everything you say, just yeah. because of the fact that you have managed to discourage them. So it has to be done with love, and it has to be done out of anger. But because you love them is why you did it. Uh, we've all heard the saying, and maybe you've said it, uh, maybe members in our audience that have children have said it, uh, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And in reality it does. Uh, it's maybe not the physical pain that the child may experience, but certainly there is a uh, mental pain there because of the fact that you have to correct the child. But you do it because you know it's in the best interest of the child. That's right. That's right. Let's go ahead and take the uh, next break is real short. On the other side of the break, we'll come back. We've got some more comments in the chat room, and many of them are relating to the very things that you're, what you were saying there, Dale. So we'll bring those in on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Greetings. I'm John Duvall. I'm Paul Adams. And I'm Tom Thornhill. And I'm Daniel Duvall. We are the host of the Truth Factor Discussion. You can join the Bible study by going to live.truthfactor.com and participating with your comments and your questions. Come join us on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock Central Time at live.truthfactor.com. All right, Travis, let's take a minute and start there with Chance's comment I'm up in the chat room. He says, on the spot correction is a proven way for the association in the mind between right and wrong to exist. And that's a very good point. On the spot correction helps the young person makes the association. Doesn't it, Micah? Yes. Yes, very good. Um, 
<laughs> Randy says, my children can be my friend when they grow up and on their own. Until then, I am their parent and am not designed to make them happy all the time. And I think it's a very good point. Barrick agrees with Chance's statement. He says, but still be wary of doing it in anger. It eventually has an adverse effect. Um, and then he says, in light of Randy's point, being a parent never stops, but the job of parenting does come to an end. And I think at this point, a child may become a friend. And then I agree with that. I mean, there's a, there will be a time that you will have a conversation with your child that you probably would not have had while they were under your house. You know, under the, not under your house, but um, under your roof, that is. Um, one of the conversations I used to enjoy is telling mom things that I did do that she didn't know. You know, well after I got out of the house and I could get outside of the reach for a paddle. But no, you, you, you can have a more mature or more friend relationship at that point. Uh, let's see, Chance says, yeah, anger should be absent in any of these actions. That's exactly right. Um, and Barrick, and, and this is a very good point. I've heard this before too. The family that prays together stays together because a common goal, a common grounding, a common foundation. So Brian says, so let me clarify. It is best not to spank when angry, or does that include all discipline when angry? It's not wrong to be angry, but we cannot let the sun go down upon our wrath. And that's right, Ephesians 4 tells us that. Be angry and sin not, do not let the sun go down upon your wrath, nor give place to the devil, in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Um, I really think, and, and this, this is a really a tough one. You have to define what is anger and what is disappointment. Because if, if you're going to discipline your child with something other than corporal punishment, letting the anger flow from you and they see the anger may not be as beneficial as letting them see the disappointment. You know, I think it'd be, at any point, it'd be better to go cool off and then administer whatever punishment. Um, you know, Mike, I think about from, from your position, would it, would it be more of a learning environment to deal with an angry parent or a disappointed parent? Um, probably a disappointed parent because when someone is angry, they're, you know, it's kind of hard to talk to them. And if you want to get a point across or something, you want to make sure you know you have a clear mind and you know what you're saying instead of being angry and just speaking out of anger. Yeah, and that's kind of the way that I would look at it as well. You know? and, and there have been times, in all, in all fairness, there have been times where I have I've gotten angry at my kids, you know, and um, they see it in dad's face. But the disappointment is a greater tool, if you would, than the anger, I would think. What do you think, Dale? Well, I, I don't think that uh, we should discipline our children when we are angry. I think that there has to be a cooling off point because yeah. of the fact that if we, if we cool off a little bit, we'll do a better job of disciplining them. And be fairer and sometimes, in the discipline. Yeah, we'll yeah. be fairer. Sometimes the best thing to do is tell the child, you go to your room, I'll be in there in a minute, and we'll discuss your punishment. Yeah. And that gives you a chance to cool off. It also gives the child a chance to think about what they did right. because they can see the disappointment of the parent at that point. But a parent should never lash out at a child at the, that very moment if they are angry because odds are they'll lose their temper to the point that they may uh, do something that they should not do. And all they'll do is discourage the child. Well, and, and let's talk about grounding. Let's say you, you're angry and you said, that's it, you can't, you can't do such and such for a month and then two days later you begin to think about it and a week later your child says mom and dad I've been I've been grounded for a week now okay you're good to go you know if you if, if you make a decision when you're angry it may be larger than what it needs to be and you exactly find yourself right. having to retract it exactly later. Right. yeah plus the fact sometimes when you make that arrangement there it's not you that has to ensure that it takes place it's the other member of the family uh, yeah. if, if you, the husband, made that decision, then the wife might be the one that has to carry out the punishment for the child, and maybe the wife didn't totally agree with it either. So if you send the child to the room and the husband and wife has a chance to talk to it, what do you think is the appropriate punishment for uh, this situation? And then they go in together. Yeah. Uh, maybe not both of them into the same room, but they've agreed on what type of punishment will be uh, given out and then they're both going to work to make sure the punishment is administered if that means that the child is grounded. Yeah, that's right, that's right. A couple more comments here, uh, several actually, uh, we'll be selective on some of them. Rosalito says, if the children do not respect parents, then the children have no respect for God. Same with the parents who do not bring children up in the discipline instruction of God. 
And that's a very good point. Rosalita, for those who don't know, is in the Philippines. And so he's, he's with us on our audio only channel. So it's always good to have you with us, Rosalito. Barrick says, Brian, there is righteous anger and naturally anger can ensue, ensue. But whenever, but whenever one spanks a child, anger should not be present because it will not be a good thing. And that's right. Randy says, Dell, I agree with your, you about being obedient to your mother and you expect your own children to obey you. However, there can be problems with that. For instance, if you tell your daughter to do something and her husband wants and expects something different, isn't she taught to obey her husband? Well, and yeah. I agree with yeah. what Randy's saying yeah. there. And, and please don't take what I was saying uh, out of context there because I did not mean that the father should say to their daughter or even their son who is married uh, that they must obey them in an area that would be outside the home. What I'm talking about is if they come to my house and I say to my daughter who is married, uh, would you go in there and help your mother wash the dishes? I expect her to go in and help wash the dishes. If she can't do that, then she doesn't need to come to my house neat. Yeah. Now, that's okay. being a little blunt, but, <laughs> but that's the kind of obedience I'm talking about. It's, He's it's tough, a, isn't he? It's an obedience out of respect is what yeah, it is. That's right. Now, I certainly would or not, honor. Yeah. I certainly would not suggest that the father or the mother should give commands or instruction to their children who are now married and have their own children yep. uh, that would be contrary to their spouse. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, I might say also, nor should I expect uh, as a father to tell my son or daughter that they're not raising their children properly in front of their children. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let's see. A couple more comments here. Let me scroll down here. We'll jump through some of these so we can get on with our lesson here. Uh, Barrick says, Moms always knows they have, they have eyes everywhere, not just in the back of their head. Mom knows what you're doing, by the way. She's watching you right now. Chance says, um, it is evident that a child can anger a parent. I'm describing healthy anger followed by non-emotional reaction. And unhealthy anger is a reaction without thoughts and consideration. And that's true. That's true. Okay. Several of the comments there uh, coming up there in the chat room. But I'm going to go ahead and we're going to take our next break, our last break for the evening. And then we will get back to a couple more points um, as we kind of pull this portion of the study to a close tonight. So anyway, stay tuned. We will be right back. If you would like more information regarding the Seminole Point Church of Christ, then visit our website at www.seminolepoint.org. Better yet, come see us. Our meeting place is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Edmond, Oklahoma. We meet Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible classes, 10.30 for worship services, and then Sunday afternoons at 5 o'clock for worship services. We also have Bible classes on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for your interest in the Seminole Point Church of Christ. We're looking forward to seeing you soon. Welcome back to our study. Um, one, one last comment, looking at the chat room there. Uh, Andrea says, uh, if I ever showed up at my childhood home and didn't pick up chores at the time, she says, I do hope that I get in trouble. You know, and and that, that's what we're talking about is respect for the parents there. And like Mike having respect for his mom, you know, respect for his dad. And all of our children being taught to have the proper respect. And in the end, and this is what we're talking about tonight, this is helping to shape the child into the person, the, the respectable person they need to be. Parents don't need to raise their children with the spirit of arrogance. They don't need to raise their children with that sense of entitlement. You know, your child may be smart, but he is neither the smartest child, nor can he be the child that is never wrong. Your child may walk early, but that doesn't mean that, he's in, that she or she is immune from walking into trouble. We need to realize as parents that our children do make mistakes. Now, I personally think the goal as parents is to raise your children so that when they are away from you, they make the right decisions. Let them mess up at home. Let them get in trouble at home. You use that time to discipline them. But the goal is to get them to the point so that when they're away from you, they make the right choices, they make the right decisions. And that's what, what our goal as parents should be. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments?
Not for me. Any for you, Mike? Not me. <laughs> All right, well, we've got just a couple of minutes remaining here in our study. Let's see, about nine more minutes. So let's go ahead and step into our next session there in regards to, as parents, we need to teach our children to maintain proper priorities. And I realize when your child is eight years old, when they're 10 years old, it might be a little bit harder to do. When they become teenagers, they have so many other things in life that they're having to deal with. But ultimately, there are certain priorities in life that our children should be taught to maintain. And that's what this next section talks about. So Mike, if you would, I'm gonna have you read a couple of passages here. The first thing that we need to recognize is that spiritual needs must take priority over schoolwork. Now, I'm not saying your kids don't have to do their schoolwork and their homework, but in the end, spiritual needs must take priority. Now, Micah, read for us Matthew chapter 6, there in verse 33 for just a moment. And this is uh, in, in the, about the middle of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All right. Now, granted, there's a whole context surrounding this, but the idea is that he's telling us to seek first the kingdom of God. So we see a priority there being instilled within the life of a child, okay? Now, turn over to one more, Micah. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This will tie hand in hand with what we're looking at here. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. All right, so where is this telling us, Michael, that we need to be setting our minds, our thoughts? Uh, in heaven. Exactly. One of the, the way I like to refer to this, Dale, and you can tell me if you think this is accurate or maybe not so accurate, is that we basically should have heavenly concerns, heavenly desires. Well, we should. In fact, uh uh, we read Matthew 6.33, if you look at Luke 12.31, Luke puts it this way, he says, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah. Uh, that would su suggest a little bit more that this should be our priority. Uh, while Matthew says seek first, Luke says rather. Uh, in other words, when it comes down to school functions or God, a good example of that was when I, I lived in Kansas City. Uh, my son and daughter played musical instruments in school. Okay. And the teacher decided that they were going to have a recital on Wednesday night, and if they weren't there, they would fail the class. And I had a nice heart-to-heart -heart talk with the teacher. I said, my children will be in Bible class on Wednesday night, and if you fail them, then you and I will be going to the superintendent to talk. And she didn't fail the children, and they were not there at, for that recital. So uh, it's a matter of emphasizing where the priority should be, and that's with God. It is. It's a matter of talking and letting them know the positions that you stand upon and what, what your family believes in. And many times communication is the way that that gets taken care of. Yeah. And Dale? I think another mm -hmm. example, too, is how about Saturday night? How late do we let our children stay up on Saturday night, knowing full well that we're going to be at worship service the next morning? Uh, do we bring our children to worship service or Bible study late? Uh, what kind of message is that sending to them? Where is the priority? And okay. as parents, we have a great responsibility to help train the child to ensure the child understands that the priority is to serve God first. All right. What is Hebrews 10, 24, and 25? How would that relate to this, to the very thing you're talking about? Well, that's a good question, and, and the Hebrew writer certainly had something to say here about that. Uh, I think 23 goes along with it as well. Okay. Uh, because in verse 23 it says, if I get turned over there, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised then we look at verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so the idea is, the priority here, why do we come together? 
But we come together to worship God, to, to share a common love, to be an encouragement to each other. And if we choose to stay home, if we choose to bring our children to services late, uh, we're not doing a very good job of encouraging one another. That's right. That's right. Um, we've got some comments in the chat room. And I, for the chat people, sorry it took me a few minutes to get that done, but we just swept clean the chat room. And um, if you've been following our chat, you'll know exactly what, <laughs> uh, what I'm talking about. It took me a little bit longer to do than what it should have. Uh, let's see. There's a couple of comments there I noticed coming through there. Um, and let's see. Rhonda makes the point that home is the training ground, and that's exactly right. And, um, and then come down a little bit farther here, she says, we train them at home to make the right choices when we're not with them, just like what we were talking about a while ago. And here she uses the example of Joseph. He was nowhere near his family and yet made godly choices. It is a godly choice to run at times. And that's exactly what we're talking about, godly choices, you know. Uh, Randy says, there was a line in the movie where a father was dealing with his son and said, your weakness as a man is my failure being a father. And there's a lot of truth to that, you know. Yeah, of, Bill Cosby also used a statement, which I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think I would say that to a child, but he says, I brought you in this world, I can take you out. <laughs> and I can make another one look just like you. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, Randy says, Dale, unfortunately, many parents just go along with the teacher and will even go with uh, the child to the event on Wednesday night. And, and, and therein lies, lies the problem that we're looking at. How you raise your child when they're young is going to determine how they behave when they're older. Okay? We've talked about this before, going on vacation. All right? You have a lot of people who are faithful in their attendance, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they're always there. But boy, let vacation time comes and their responsibility is Sunday morning and they're done. They don't do anything else any other time. And even that, some don't, don't even go on Sunday morning. It's like we're on vacation from church. Okay? The problem is when you raise your children up seeing that example, you're not raising them up to see God first. Okay, spiritual matters most important. You're raising them up to see something else, and it does affect the way that they turn out. Unless they, despite you, develop a better uh, devotion for the Lord. Yeah, a better devotion there. Barrett says, when I was on vacation in Ukraine, he still found a congregation there to attend. I mean, that's what you have to do. You plan ahead of time. So. All right, let's see, we are out of time now, and we kind of touched on the first point there of making certain that we maintain the proper spiritual priorities and put those things in place. Now, Michael, we'll plan to have you sit in again with us next week as we continue this discussion. And I realize it may appear that we're kind of taking a slow walk through this, but that's fine because we really appreciate your participation and your comments. And I have found out how to clean the chat room up if we get a few stray comments there um, that are contrary to our studies. But we'd like to thank you so much for joining us this evening and for all your, your participation in our study, your comments and so forth and questions. They're all, always greatly appreciated. Uh, Dell, any final thoughts or comments before we close for tonight? No, we've had a lot of good comments from the chat room and I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, hopefully you feel that this has been a good study and, and will continue to be a good study next week. I won't be here next week. Ah, uh, okay. Because I had to take my brother-in-law who preached for over 40 years. He loves to go fishing. He's retired now, and so I'll be taking him fishing next week. Okay. On Sunday? Nope. On Sunday. <laughs> nope, nope. We leave on Monday. We come back on Saturday. I will be here on Sunday. <laughs> well, maybe and just... I'll be here Wednesday night, too. It may be just you and I next week. <laughs> there you go. Do you have any final thoughts or comments, Micah? Um, not that I know of. Okay. <laughs> thank you for joining us this evening, and we'd like to thank you for joining us for this time period of studying the Word of God and seeking the scriptural way. Join us again next Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. when we will continue this discussion, maintaining proper priorities within the life of our children, right here at live.scripturalway.com. Dot org. Have a wonderful week.